Well, it's been quite the day. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball Today on Thursday, March 14th. I am Frank Stanfield, joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on the show, Dylan Cease traded to the Padres. Out of nowhere, what is going on? We did get some unfortunate injury news on Devin Williams right before the show started. And deep sleepers, all of them. Well, actually, however many we can get to. A, a lot of them. I, uh, we're going to try and be rapid fire with it. I, re- I genuinely want to be rapid fire with them. But before, I'm going to derail us before we get a chance to be rapid fire. No. Scott, you didn't move Garrett Cole down as far as Frank and I did, did you? I did not. No. I moved him. Uh, just inside my top 100, this is for Roto, just inside my top 100 among starting pitchers, he's 27th. I moved Blake Snell down to about the same point. He's 26th. So I have Snell one spot ahead of Cole. I have the two of them in between Yuri Perez and Chris Sale. Uh, and that's where I'm putting him. Now, that that's not to say I will definitely draft Garrett Cole there. It's It obviously depends on the circumstances of my build, the depth of the league. If it's a shallower league, I'm I'm more likely to to take the shot on him as early as I can justify it. If it's a deeper league, I I might push the limits the other way, see how long I can wait for him. And just because I'm seeing you guys ranking him lower, I'm seeing others talking about him more in the 150 or even 200 range overall. Yeah, it's 150-ish for me. I I might be inclined to wait just for that reason to see how far to see how late I can get him while keeping in mind uh that I do think the discount is worth it at that point. So, yeah, I mean, if you missed the emergency pod, Yankees are saying at least one to two months. Uh, none of their many examinations have found damage to the UCL, but he is de- seeing Dr. Neil Elitraj. I mean, by the, the time... The new James Andrews. <laughs> yeah, by the James time you're listening to this retired, podcast, so we, we, we may know more. Yeah. Um, but it's... We, we, we at least know that it's probably not... We at least know it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while that Garrett Cole's out. It's, I'm treating it as it's probably not Tommy John's if they haven't found UCL damage yet. I, I guess it maybe Neil Elitraj will find something that everyone else missed. But I'm, I'm thinking it's not as severe as quite as severe as that. But obviously, uh, obviously, you'll need to draft Garrett Cole with great caution because it's not totally conclusive and even still we know it's going to be at least may until we see him at least and that is uh potentially an optimistic take on garrett cole i dropped him down to sp 49 around 175th overall in the rankings maybe i'm just overly pessimistic i i just have a feeling this is not You're end well famous but- yankees hater <laughs> That's exactly right. I, you know, I saw an interesting exchange which, between a Yankee beat writer and Aaron Boone, where they were asking, "Is there a tear detected?" It's a very clear question. They're and being Aaron very, Boone, they're they are very artful about how they're dodging that question. They right are now. just dodging it completely. Mm-hmm. Like he just danced around. They asked one more time, "Has a tear been to de- de- been detected?" Aaron Boone, so far, I don't know. And that's it. That's it's it. like the even the reporting, which doesn't need to be as artful and as you know, granted on the granted on the you know basis of anonymity or whatever, is like no tears have been detected in imaging, and it's like that is not the same as there are no tears. And yeah, I I don't know. I relayed the the Walker Bueller anecdote, and it's just an anecdote. It's one sample size, but that was one where he didn't have a tear until Dr. Neil Alatrosh did an exploratory surgery and they figured out, oh, it was a tear. It just wasn't visible on the MRI. And they did Tommy John surgery during that surgery. So I'm worried. What was that? What was that? Walker Who Bueller was that? in 2022. Bueller, okay. Yeah, yeah we, we've got to keep things moving here. It will be fun to see how much money the Yankees wind up spending on Blake Snell because <laughs> I, I do think that will be happening because they are not getting Dylan Cease. Dylan Cease was traded to the Padres in exchange for three prospects, two pitchers in Drew Thorpe and Yairo Iriarte, plus outfielder Samuel Zavala and reliever Steven Wilson. So the Padres effectively replaced Blake Snell with younger right-handed Blake Snell, that is Dylan Cease, uh, who had a down year last year, a 458 ERA, a 142 whip, still provided 214 strikeouts, the eighth most in baseball. Almost everything went wrong for Dylan Cease last year. The walks went up, harder contact allowed, 
Swinging strike rate and fastball velocity both dropped down a little bit compared to the year prior. But, but the Padres are a much better team, and this is a much better ballpark to pitch in for Dylan Cease. The ADP is 97.8 as the SP28 off the board. Wouldn't surprise me if that ADP starts to tick up a little bit here, Scott. Whenever there's a player in the news or a big trade like this, it just seems inevitable that ADP starts to tick up a little bit, which if that happens, then we're talking about Dylan Cease going in that Justin Steele, Yuri Perrine, uh, Perez range of the draft. Uh, do you plan to move Dylan Cease up in your rankings at all? I don't. And, you know, I, I, it's not like... It's not like it's a huge venue upgrade. I don't even know that it's a huge supporting cast upgrade. I wasn't, maybe Cecil would be what gets the Padres in the playoffs. I don't know, but I didn't have him as a playoff team before then. Um, it's a little bit better in both areas, I would say. But I don't think it matters in Cease's case. You know what? Cease controls his own, own destiny here yeah. because the stuff is so overwhelming. And it's not like his problems have been home run related anyway. He's, he's always been good at preventing those. It's just got to throw strikes. I think Cease is probably going to have a pretty good season. ERA and whip on the high side, ton of strikeouts, really like his 20. 21 season where mm -hmm. he had a 391 ERA, 125 whip, 226 strikeouts. That's that's what I think is going to happen. But he could have an amazing season that wins him the Cy Young. He could have a really rough season that wrecks your ERA and whip and you rue the day you drafted mm -hmm. him. It's such a wide range of outcomes that I don't really think this trade matters for fantasy purposes. It's just it just really comes down to what kind of Dylan Cease are we getting? this year early returns this spring have been great i i think it's i i think it's sus suspicious maybe that's not the best word choice but i think it's telling maybe that uh the the rumor mill for him started to heat up right after that big was it a nine strikeout effort or eight strikeout effort against the reds the other day like once he started making headlines with his performance this spring the 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 trade market heated up for Dylan Cease mm -hmm. as if teams are are starting to feel optimistic about him again. And I will note he's thrown eighty three percent of his pitches for strikes this spring. It's eight and a third innings. Well, it, any kind of strike rate could happen over that sample. I how many pitches is that? It is. Uh, it has he's to thrown seventy one pitches. Seventy one. Yeah, that number's not right then, because MLB.com's box scores. If it's not a baseball savant page, they're fiction. It's it's a weird thing. If you want to get into it, I can explain what's weird about it. But the okay. way it works is if you throw an eight pitch at bat and you get a strikeout, you get three strikes and no balls. If you throw a four pitch at bat for a walk, you get four pitches, four balls. And that's on MLB.com? That's when it's not Baseball Savant. So what's weird is that some of them are on Baseball Savant and they have real pitch tracking and some of them are not and they do not. It's yeah. really dumb. They also will do something where if you get five strikeouts in a start and they're all recorded via swinging strike, the, the final strike, they will say you got 15 swinging strikes in that start. Why are they doing Is it just a it bug? Is, I assume it it's a bug. So mad. No, this is the way their system works during spring training. It's so but they dumb. call it number of pitches. I don't, I don't I understand. Know. And how do you I know, know this? Even? How do you know this? Where, where did you get your info? There was <laughs> someone posted something about uh, Spencer Strider getting like 21 swing and misses on 60 pitches or whatever it was the other day. And there was some talk about it on Twitter. And someone pointed out that no, All right. the pitch data on... All right, MLB. so I don't know. I don't know what act. percent of strikes Cease yeah. has thrown, but he's been really dominant this spring in the fourteen market. strikeouts, two walks, and eight in a third inning. Yeah. That's what you need to know, basically. Yeah. Uh, Chris, do you plan to move up Dylan Cease at all? I was really genuinely surprised to look at the rankings just now and realize I am the low guy on Dylan Cease. I will fully uh, admit I just moved him up like a few spots. I, I think from twenty eight to twenty six. So, uh, so I have him at ninety seven overall. I, I don't know. Maybe at starting pitcher, I have him twenty eighth. Okay, so in the same same range. But yeah, I I technically have him lower, and I feel like I've drafted him more than you guys this year. So maybe I have to move Dylan C's up because 
I'm pretty optimistic. It's kind of the opposite of Blake Snell, where I'll draft Dylan Cease when he's coming off a bad season, and I'll fade him when he's coming off a good season. I, I think that's your expectation, like, like Scott said, should be close-ish to what he did in 2021 with 220 strikeouts. That's probably reasonable. I'm That's that's the one thing you can count on, yes. barring injury, of course, cuz that's always that's always the downside risk for every pitcher, but like the downside risk for Dylan Cease is still a league leader in strikeouts, among and the league I, leaders in strikeouts. I don't think <clears throat> I was looking this up the other day. I don't know when the last time Dylan Cease missed a start, but it's been a very long time. Now, Garrett Cole is about to miss 2 months, so that's not right. actually Right. A super useful predictor, but he made 12 starts in 2020. Remember, shortened season, 29 in 2019, 23 in 2018, 22 in 2017. That was when in low A. So he's been remarkably healthy for a pretty long time, which in as much as there is any reason to feel good about a pitcher's ability to stay healthy, Dylan Cease should give you a pretty good reason to think he can. The updated Padres rotation is looking pretty good overall. You Darvish, Joe Musgrove, Dylan Cease, Michael King, and Johnny Brito as their SP5. Before we move on to the prospect package, Scott, you and I were talking a little bit about this on Twitter. Uh, do you unload all of your fab on Dylan Cease in an NL only league? I realize that's a very small portion of the audience, but yes. Yes, I do. I mean, you're going to get usually. Um... I try to save almost all of that as much as I can reasonably can for the trade deadline, but you're going to, you're going to get a full season for yeah, you're three extra months out of Dylan. Right. Six. Right. So I, I unload, obviously if, if your minimum bid is $1 rather than zero, you have to save something. It probably makes a difference too whether your waivers run daily or weekly mine run daily. So it's easier to come away with uh $0 players when needed, but the waiver wires, there's never much to it in an NL only league. I, I mostly feel bad for the people who've already had AL AL only drafts at this point. Yeah. So I play an NL labor. There are no zero dollar bids. It's one hundred dollars for the entire season, and so I'm already thinking I can't spend all of my money. I could probably spend a, a, a good chunk of it, more than fifty percent. But uh, someone out there might actually go for the, the full one hundred percent on Dylan Cease. We shall see. Seems like the White Sox actually made out pretty well here in getting three of the Padres' top 10 prospects in Drew Thorpe, Samuel Savala, and Yairo Iriarte. Um, what are your thoughts on the return here? Because it feels like we could see Thorpe at some point this season, and, and there is a lot of hype around Drew Thorpe. He's coming off an amazing season in the minors. Worth mentioning, he came over from the Yankees in the Juan Soto trade. Now he gets mm -hmm. shipped over to the White Sox. Scott, what do you think about this them. return? It is interesting to kind of mash together the two the two trades and figure out what the, the, the Padres traded Juan Soto for in that case. Um, you know, they got two of their higher rotation guys in Cease and King. So maybe it was fine. I, I mean, Thorpe, I, obviously he's changing leagues. Uh, he had a pretty good chance of appearing in the Padres rotation sooner than later. Cause it, it was, it was kind of a mess there too. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know that this really impacts his timetable. He is a, Divisive prospect, I would say, is Drew Thorpe. Did lead the minors in strikeouts last year. Did regularly work into the seventh inning, which is rare for mm -hmm. prospects. Kept it going even after he got to double A. But it's a, it's a change up. Like he has an amazing change up and not a great fastball to go with it. So um, just some people are naturally skeptical of that profile. And, and that's fair. I mean, I think it's hard to assess any pitching prospect with great accuracy anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of open-minded to Drew Thorpe being good. But um, I, I think the more urgent development for fantasy is that presumably this means, um, forgetting his name, Garrett presumably Crochet. this means Garrett Crochet is in the rotation now and he's been mm -hmm. lining up radar guns this spring, RP eligible guy, uh, hasn't doesn't have much experience starting, certainly not since becoming a pro. But I mean, really not since like, I don't think he started full time since 2019. The upside is enticing enough that he's now yeah. deserving of late round consideration is Garrett Crochet. Yeah, the focus later on in the podcast will be deep sleepers. And I think Garrett Crochet yeah. fits that to a T. I mean, correction. Uh, he has never started full time. <clears throat> I, Garrett not, Crochet has not since high school has not made more than six starts in a season. 
I was going to say he's never done it in the minors either. Yeah, but he was not a full time starter in the in the in college. A very interesting pitcher is Garrett Crochet. He's got a big leg kick. He throws hard with the fastball. He's got a wipeout slider. Has thrown six shutout innings this spring with nine strikeouts, to zero walks. As Scott mentioned, has RP eligibility on CBS. So if you're playing a points league, could turn out to be a a sneaky spark there in Garrett Crochet. All right, again the big trade. Dylan Cease traded over to the Padres in exchange for three prospects, and uh, we will see him uh, a little bit later on. Not in the Korea series against the Dodgers because those pitchers are already set, but. Uh, yeah, my guess will be the, the first weekend there with the Padres. Before we hit our first break, reminder to subscribe to the FBT newsletter. Chris does a lot of work every day, puts it in. Uh, CBSSports.com slash newsletters. You can scan the QR code on the screen. That'll take you right to the website. Click the FBT logo, punch in your email address. It's easy as that. And one last reminder to get those FBT Listener League submissions in. Just a few days left. Email fantasybaseball at cbsi.com. That's the letter I put FBT listener league in the subject line. Send us something creative, a song, song lyrics, a poem, a Photoshop. Just let us know how, how much you, you want to be in the league or why you deserve to be in the league. We have a 12 team head to head points league, which will be drafting on Tuesday night, this upcoming Tuesday, March 19th. And the for the people league is a 16 team head to head categories league. And that will be drafted the following Tuesday night on March 26th. Let's take our first break. When we return, the rest of the news and notes here. Fantasy Baseball Today. The blackout mystery. Remains. Welcome to March Madness. Oh, oh, you just never know in the tournament who is going to shine. Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. Welcome back in. Lots of news to get to. Just before we went live, we got an update from Jeff Passan that Brewers closer Devin Williams has two stress fractures in his back and is expected to miss around three months of the season. Huge loss for the Brewers and for fantasy. Devin Williams was being drafted as the top closer in ADP. 51.8 was that fantasy pros ADP. Chris, we'll start with you. Who is next in the Brewers bullpen? It seems like there are three options here. Yoel Piomps, Trevor McGill, Abner Uribe. They all pitched pretty well last year. Some throw harder than others, but three pretty interesting pitchers in the mix here for Brewers saves. So it's a different manager, so we can't say for sure that the usage trends from last season are going to carry over. But, I mean, here's the inning that Yoel Piamps worked in every game that he appeared in in September. 8, 7, 11, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8 7, 8. I think it's you all pimes. I, I think it's actually pretty clearly him. I know that Uribe throws a little harder and gets a few more strikeouts and also can't really find the strike zone with a map. <laughs> uh, he was really bad in his spring outing today. So maybe I'm being a little harsh because of that. But I, I think given the way that these pitchers were used last season, it's likely to be pimes next man up McGill very rarely threw in the eighth inning last season. Uribe very rarely threw in the eighth inning last season as well. So I, I think Piams is pretty clearly going to be the next guy. up. Scott, do you have the same answer? It's the same answer. It's with less confidence since it is a new manager. And since Abner Uribe has some of that like closer and waiting, uh, vibe to him. Um, but, if, if, if you ha if I was forced to pick one today, it would be Yoel Piamps. I think unless the Brewers come out and say, this is who's going to work the ninth inning for us with Devin Williams down, I'd be reluctant to pay a premium for any of them. I, like, I, I'd probably take uh, um, Suarez, uh, Robert Suarez, and uh, Jose Leclerc ahead of any of the Brewers' options, ahead of Piamps. But Piamps would be my guess. And we haven't even mentioned Trevor McGill, who is the brother of Tyler McGill, who also pitched pretty well last year at 363 ERA. He actually had the highest swinging strike rate and highest K per nine of the three relievers, McGill, Uribe, and Piomps. Uh, McGill averaged 99.2 miles per hour on the fastball. So they have some options. I'm with you guys. I, I think it's Piomps first, but we'll see if we do get any indications from 
uh, the manager or the beat writers from Milwaukee. Scott, do you think this changes the closer market at all for fantasy? Do you think maybe it, as a result of Devin Williams going out, we see Edwin Diaz and, and Emmanuel Class A, Josh Hader start to push up a little bit, or maybe even that second tier of Rysel Iglesias, Yoan Duran, Jordan Romano, do they maybe start to creep up a little bit as a result of losing a top tier closer? I think it'd be more likely in like a 15 team league where you're already stretching that position much thinner in a 12 team league. I'm, I'm not expecting a noticeable difference. There are figures to be a slight difference just because you are removing one at the top there, but it is only one. And um, I think everybody's habits, everybody who's used to drafting their habits are going to kind of, stay in place. And I, I don't expect a huge change in the 12 teamers or certainly anything less. All right, let's keep things moving here. It's not like the Marlins have had enough pitching injuries already this spring, but Yuri Perez was pulled on Wednesday with a recurrence of the broken nail on his right middle finger. And it's been tough for him to build up that pitch count since uh, he just hasn't been able to throw so much uh, in the games or, or even, you know, in bullpens, whatever it might be. Chris, I know you were very high on Yuri Perez. Do you mm -hmm. plan to lower him at all? Uh, because of this lack of a buildup. I'm not really to, like we knew Yuri Perez wasn't going to throw 180 innings this season anyway. So, Hey, here's, here's a natural way to limit his innings a little bit. I, I don't know. I, it's a little concerning because it's happening multiple times. And if you're a Marlins fan and, and you're my age, at least you remember Josh Beckett's early career being, uh, not necessarily derailed, but there were some speed bumps as a result of some recurring blister issues that I think a lot of Marlins fans my age might have some uh, some traumatic memories of. But no, I, I don't. I, this doesn't really change how Yuri Perez down a little. Like I, I moved him behind Grayson Rodriguez and Bobby Miller because I already. Have him. I, I think I have him behind. Uh, do I have him behind both or just Grayson? Just by virtue of yeah. I'll move yeah, him behind they, Bobby. They, they Miller, keep, sure. The it keep he keeps breaking the nail. They're gonna have to give him longer to heal each mm -hmm. time. And now we're on the verge of the start of the season, basically. And I don't I, I it, what happens if it breaks the next time, too? You know, like it could just keep pushing him back sure. and pushing him back and become a total headache. So um I only moved him down slightly, but I did you move Yuri Perez down. Yeah, slightly. I moved him, I moved him one spot down in the pitcher rankings. That's that's fair. Let's say you're on the clock here on a, in a draft on Thursday. Are you taking Dylan Cease or Yuri Perez? Cease. Ooh. I still have Yuri ahead of him, but it's very close. They're within five spots in my overall rankings now. Yeah, I moved Dylan Cease just ahead of him in the overall rankings. And uh, it, it's kind of in conjunction with both of these things happen. Moving Cease up ever so slightly because sure. of the move to the Padres and moving Yuri Perez down just a, a tad because of this recurring uh, fingernail issue. Aaron Judge is, quote, penciled in to return Saturday following treatment on his abdominal muscles. We'll see how he bounces back. Guardians pitching coach Carl Willis said that he believes Gavin Williams will be cleared to resume throwing, quote, soon. Williams hurt his pitching elbow while throwing weighted balls during a workout last weekend. Kyle Schwarber was scratched Wednesday after feeling something in his right groin, but is expected to be in the lineup on Thursday. Ian Happ, who's been slowed by a left hamstring injury, is on track to be ready for opening day. Kodai Senga will begin a throwing program on March 22nd, one week later than initially projected. If everything goes well, he could still be, be back sometime in May. Will Smith, the Dodgers catcher, was scratched Wednesday due to lower back tightness, and it's a little bit more meaningful when we get updates from Dodgers and Padres players now because... They're already on the plane. They're they're ready to go. They're out to Korea. They are playing in real games a week from today. So hopefully Will Smith will be all right to play in those games. I'm sure we will learn more in the coming days. David Bednar will throw off a mound in the coming days. He's been uh, slowed by right lat tightness. Opening day remains up in the air as of now. Kyle Bradish threw a bullpen session on Wednesday. His first time throwing off a mound since being diagnosed with a partial UCL tear back in mid-February. It was only fastballs, but obviously this is a positive step in his recovery. Taj Bradley will be shut down from throwing for at least two weeks due to a right pectoral strain. It sounds like the two names, although there was like five names listed, I think these two are the most likely. Uh, Jacob Lopez and now Yuki 
Uwasawa are options to be the Rays' fifth starter. Lopez is 26 years old and actually pitched well in the minors last year. Uwasawa is a 30-year-old from Japan who signed a minor league deal with the Rays back in January, and he, he pitched well in Japan last year, just no strikeouts. Six points yeah, for nine. So I, I will point out that's actually like roughly an average strikeout rate for the Nippon League last year. Um, he was like 18 percent or 17 percent, something like that. And that's that's right around average. Their strikeout rate is about three or four points lower than the the MLB average. So th that's something to keep in mind, but probably not a strikeout pitcher. Do you guys have a feel or any interest in either of these names? I mean, Jacob Lopez had a good outing today. And like you said, a high strikeout rate in the minors last year. I think he's kind of interesting, not to the point that I'm drafting him in standard size leagues, though. Okay. Is he is he a deep sleeper? He's a double deep sleeper. Oh, so for the AL onlyers out there, Jacob Lopez might be a name for you. JP France will make his spring debut on Saturday against the Mets. And if all goes well, there's a good chance he will be in the Astros opening day rotation at least as long as Justin Verlander is on the IL. Braxton Garrett is expected to throw a live batting practice session as soon as this weekend. He's been slowed with left shoulder soreness and will start the season on the IL. Red Sox manager Alex Cora said that prospect Sedan Rafaela could be used some at second base. I suggested so, this yesterday, Frank. You did, you did. Uh, we know Vaughn Grissom is likely to start the season on the IL due to a groin injury. And last year in the minors, Rafaela hit 302 with 20 homers, 36 steals, and an 869 OPS. Has flashed some power and speed here in spring training as well. What do we think? Deep sleeper, Rafaela? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do worry a little bit about him just getting so comfortable there that the, the spot never reopens for Vaughn Grissom. Ultimately, the Red Sox want Rafaela as their center fielder. He's amazing in center field, but. Uh, if everybody stays healthy, then and 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 he hits well, maybe he spends a long time at second base. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, he was viewed as an elite center fielder, but also a very, very good defensive shortstop as well. So mm -hmm. you would think he'll be plus at second base pretty easily. Yeah, we'll see what happens with Vaughn Grissom, Scott. But to quote one of my favorite movies of all time, <laughs> life uh, finds a way. Continuing on with the prospects, Padres prospect Graham Pauly has been told he will be on the Padres opening day roster for their two game series in Korea next week. And we mentioned Graham Pauly's name recently. He's likely to start at third base as long as Manny Machado is limited to DH. Pauly is 23 years old last year in the minors. Pretty impressive. Hit 308, 23 homers, 22 steals. Kind of fits with the theme of today. Deep sleepers. What do we think? Any I interest in Graham Pauly? I believe I wrote about him as a deep sleeper in one of three deep sleeper columns that I've written at this point. Um, deep sleepers are fun because you can just throw guys at the at the wall. Yeah, you don't. Grand Pauly gives me a little a little Spencer Steer vibes okay. at this time last year, where like he's not a super huge prospect. He's like a borderline top ten guy in the Padres system, and Padres aren't a great system at this point. Not a terrible one, but. 23 homers, 22 steals last year. The thing he doesn't have that Spencer Steer has is a very, very good home ballpark. Grand Poly has a pretty bad one uh, mm -hmm. for hitting. So that makes it less likely that he can live up to, you know, any kind of hype. But yeah. I think a 15, 15, 270 hitter has value in, in any if categories league. My hunch is Polly doesn't work out. That's mm -hmm. my hunch. And so it would be a low investment in him in the sort of deep league where that's the best you could do off the waiver wire. I'll take a shot on it. This is the kind of profile, Graham Pauly, that uh, I think like during the juice ball era, it would sneak up on sure, everybody yeah. because the ball traveled so much better. Um, but I'm, I'm just not sure he has the juice in the swing to survive in San Diego in this era. All right, let's quickly run through some of the standouts from Wednesday, the spring standouts. Louis Varland of the Twins threw four shutout innings with four strikeouts to one walk. And again, kind of seems like a deep sleeper uh, himself. Last year, the ERA and whip, not so great, uh, but 12.6% swinging strike rate. Got some strikeouts in the minors. Any interest in Louis Varland? Not a lot. Okay. I mean, you could call him a deep sleeper, I guess. Yeah. 
<laughs> you could call anyone a deep sleeper. Pretty like much. Say, throw it against the wall, see what happens. Yeah. Uh, someone who I believe is a deep sleeper for Scott is Jonathan Aranda, who went two oh, yeah. two with his first home run of the spring. He is 12 for 29, batting 414 with an 1124 OPS. And hopefully, hopefully, the Rays finally give him a shot. I think he's penciled in as their DH. He yeah. does have first base eligibility on CBS. I think he might be util only on other websites, but yeah, hopefully this is the time, Scott. Jonathan Aranda. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I think it's now or never. The The Rays have been pretty, uh, have made it pretty clear that they want him to take advantage of this opportunity they're giving him. And the minor league numbers are just absurd. Like, I wish I could read them off to you, but I don't have them handy. We got to keep the show moving. But it was something like, I mean, particularly if you take out. He's played 199 games at AAA. He has a 328 batting average, 421 OBP, 565 slugging percentage. That undersells it even because he hit like 370 over the final four months last year. 339 with a 1063 OPS overall at AAA last year. And the the velocities are great and the plate discipline is great. He is a beefier baseball boy than I thought. I wouldn't say he's a beefy baseball boy, but in, in catching a little bit of him today, on the beefier side, Mm-hmm. He's like a a medium beefy yeah. boy. What's like what's like a medium sized steak, Chris? I, you'd know this better than I would, I guess. Um, I, I don't. I, I don't like know. a New York strip or something. I don't know. Yeah, I guess that. Yeah, <laughs> let's go with that. Sure. Uh, Jack Final Clark. 334 plate appearances at AAA last year. Jonathan Aranda hit 375 with 23 homers and a 1163 OPS. Average exit velocity 92.3 miles per hour. Max 113. <laughs> Let's go. Jack Flaherty threw four shutout innings with five strikeouts to zero walks after getting blown up in his last start. He had 11 swinging strikes on 57 pitches after what Chris told us. I have no idea if that's accurate or not, but the velocity has been up for Jack Flaherty this spring. And when he signed with the Tigers, they were talking a big game that they know what to do to, to fix Jack Flaherty. So we'll see. Carlos Rodon looked better. He's on the road, I guess, to, uh, to redemption. Baseball savant numbers in the spring you can you can trust. Okay. At least the swing and strike numbers. I have no idea if they're properly calibrated for velocity and Justin Turner's hilarious pop fly home run today was not tracked for some reason. So there there there's still some kinks there. But all that that rant I went on is does not apply to the games that are on baseball savant, which is like 45% of them. Gotcha. Carlos Rodon, as I mentioned, he looked better. Four innings, one run, three strikeouts to zero walks. 94.6 miles per hour on the fastball, which is the best we've seen from him in spring so far. Scott's boy, Chris Bassett, five and a third innings, one run, nine strikeouts with 11 swinging strikes on 73 pitches. All right. He threw like nine different pitches today. I don't know if you've seen the... It's just the, the, it's the Chris Bassett way, man. Yeah, it was just like the, the entire kitchen, not just the sink. Uh, your boy, Chris, Sixto Sanchez through two no hit innings, apparently maxed out at 99 miles per hour on the fastball. I mean, if you're worried about Tanner Scott, the Marlins <laughs> don't really have anybody who is like solidified, solidified in the back half of the bullpen. I'm just saying Sixto deep, deep, deep sleeper, <laughs> the deepest of sleepers, but the stuff was, he was only like one mile per hour off his 2020 averages today. I was really surprised by that. Uh, Michael Garcia back-to-back days with a home run for the Royals, and he was leading off here on Wednesday. I wrote him up in Sleepers 2.0. Yoshinobu Yamamoto struck out seven, but also allowed four earned runs over 4.2 innings and ends his spring with an 8.38 ERA. Hmm. Wasn't a lot of hard contact, Um, especially the first. I think he had two bad innings. The first one was just like, 86 mile an hour singles to right field over and over. Um, it wasn't, he did, he wasn't great, but I'm not too worried about it now. Bryce Elder gave up five earned runs over four and a third innings and has an 8.25 ERA. Kind of feels like uh, Ronaldo Lopez might be trending towards that SP5 job for the Braves. Christian Javier threw four shutout innings with four strikeouts to one walk. It's really good so far in the spring. Let's see. Uh, Luis Severino, same thing, four innings, one run, three strikeouts. And he has a spring ERA of one with a 0.56 whip. Let's take our final break. When we return, all of the deep sleepers here on Fantasy Baseball Today. 
It's time for the madness. And CBS Sports HQ has your wall-to-wall NCAA tournament coverage. We got your game highlights, expert analysis, and insights all the way to the Final Four. Start and end your March Madness coverage with CBS Sports HQ. All right, let's talk deep sleepers. I am using NFBC Draft Champions ADP over the past week. These are 15-team, 50-round drafts, so they go extremely deep into the player pool. And yes, this is the most applicable for those in deeper leagues, 15-team leagues, AL, NL only. But if you play in shallower leagues, these are names that are also rapidly approaching up draft boards, and they are names that you should throw on your scout team now because they could make an impact earlier in the season. Scott, start us off, man. A deep sleeper that you have been targeting recently in drafts. Davis Schneider. Talk to me. Great power numbers. Great on base skills. He got glasses a couple years ago, and he's taken off. Puts the ball in the air where well to his pull side. Uh, 416 OBP, 969 OPS at AAA last year. 404 and 1008 in the majors. Um, a question how much second base he plays for the Blue Jays, but I think he'll play a lot and underrated production for Davis Schneider. The ADP for Davis Schneider is 422.7 over the past week, and looks like he will have a job somewhere for the Blue Jays, whether it's in the infield, the outfield, he can bounce around a little bit, uh, and he was pretty awesome down the stretch last year. Chris, over to you, a deep sleeper you've been drafting recently. Victor Scott the second. Mm. Not the first one. Not the first? That guy's not any good. Uh, yeah, no, Victor Scott has been one of the talks of spring training so far. He is hitting 367 with an 890 OPS. He is potentially an elite defensive center fielder. He is an elite base runner, 94 stolen bases in 132 games last year. Quality of contact, much better than an Estuary Ruiz type. Uh, he had a 7, 794 OPS last season, got to double A, was really good at double a and with Tommy Edmonds injury, I it's not guaranteed that Victor Scott gets an opportunity on opening day. It's not even close to guaranteed. I would say it's probably only like a 25% chance, but I will tell you that I just, as we were starting to record this podcast, saw Derek gold, who is the Cardinals writer for the St. Louis dispatch post dispatch. Headline, why Cardinals should set clear path for Victor Scott to steal opening day roster spot. Mm. That doesn't necessarily, like, he's not reporting that that's what they're going to do. But I like to see that kind of rumbling from someone who Derek Gold is incredibly plugged into the Cardinals. So that makes me feel good. I've drafted him in TGFBI. I drafted him, I think, in the Raz Bowl um, or Raz Slam. Those are deep leagues. Those are leagues where you go 400 plus in the player pool. Raz Slam is like 580 or something. So got to be in deeper leagues. But I don't know if Victor Scott, if we knew right now Victor Scott was on the open day roster and playing center field for the St. Louis Cardinals, he's a top 150 pick, right? Not for me. Let's keep going. I'm <laughs> going with Will Benson here as my next. Uh, deep sleeper who's just a little inside the top 300 I'll admit but I, I don't think he's gotten nearly enough attention especially now that uh uh there's there's more space with with uh, the injury to uh uh not the injury the suspension to Noel V Marte less of a log jam there last year in only 329 plate appearances Will Benson 11 homers 19 steals strikes out too much but still that power speed combo for his ladies you get him and now close to full-time at bats i'm in it's my fifth outfielder sorry that was rude chris i was right. just no to it's not ball. rude to me <laughs> it was rude to frank who was supposed to go next yeah no it's all right no one wants to hear my deep sleepers but i'll give them anyway tyler mcgill from the new york mets this is a pitcher we have had interest in in the past hasn't worked so far in the majors he's made some changes this offseason he added a new splitter that he's saying he learned from kodai senga and they are calling it the american spork which i love he's also uh, throwing a new cutter and in the spring, he's, he's looked pretty good so far. McGill, 1.5 ERA, 0.75 whip, 15 strikeouts to two walks over 12 innings. And he might only be in the rotation as long as Seng is there. But if he's really good, maybe he'll stick around. So I do like uh, yeah. Tyler McGill. He's been rising up draft boards. 
Chris, I co-sign. I co-sign. Chris, back to you and make it quick. Or else. Or else you're muted and you can't talk. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Gavin Stone, uh, who is a very similar prospect to where Drew Thorpe is this year. Obviously, Gavin Stone was pretty disastrous last season, but there have been very good explanations for why he was disastrous. He dealt with a blister on his foot that messed with his mechanics. He was tipping his pitches. He got a bigger glove this spring uh, to help not tip his pitches, I suppose, is the explanation. This is a guy in his minor league career has a 3.19 ERA and a 33% strikeout rate. Like uh, Drew Thorpe, the changeup is top of the line grade, and it's just a question of whether he can do enough else well to, to get to the point where he can put guys away with it. I love betting on him, especially now that he's got a rotation spot pretty much locked up. Yep, Emmett Sheehan likely to start the year on the IL, as is Walker Bueller. It looks like Gavin Stone will be the team's SP5. The ADP over the past week, 399.1. And Scott, we're back to you. All right, I'm going to say Jose Siri. If we want a name we haven't talked about much. Uh, 25 homers last year broke through in that regard. Says he wants to steal 30 bases this year. It's certainly fast enough to. The Rays in general are saying they plan to run a lot more this year. Take advantage of those rules those new rules last year, they, they actually put it exactly that way. Um, and so I think uh, it makes sense that Siri would run more might bring you down in batting average, but if there's 25, 25 potential there, then he is being severely overlooked. Yeah. The batting average is going to be bad, but I, I read a similar report about him wanting to steal bases. The, <laughs> the raw tools are there. He hits the ball hard. He's extremely fast. I, I like that call with uh, Jose Siri. I'm going to go with Jared Jones. He's a name that we've mentioned recently. Yep. I think going to wind up being the SP5 on the Pirates opening day roster. He's a pitching prospect for the team. He throws extremely hard. We're talking 99 miles per hour at the fastball. He's got this cutter slider hybrid thing that he also uses. Might only be a two pitch pitcher, but when you throw 100 miles per hour with a really good, you know, cutter slider, that might be all you need for, for Jared Jones. So the numbers in the minors have, you know, kind of, not been great so far, um, and, and there are issu issues with control, but I, I think there is big strikeout upside here and pretty good ballpark to pitch in there with the Pirates. So I am in on Jared Jones. Chris, back to you. We don't want to overreact to spring training stats, but Tanner Scott has yet to finish any of his four innings that he has started so far this spring, which is pretty bad for a guy who before last season had never been able to throw strikes consistently. I am targeting some Marlins pitchers in the later rounds of deeper leagues. And Anthony Bender is the guy I'm looking at as the most likely potential alternative to Tanner Scott. Remember 2022 before uh, he had Tommy John surgery, Anthony Bender was the Marlins closer for about a month. I think he's the most likely to step up if Tanner Scott struggles, given that he's had that ex that uh, opportunity before 290 ERA 1.16 whip 88 strikeouts and 80 and two thirds innings at the major league level through his career, uh, Tanner or Anthony Bender, excuse me. Yeah. Tanner Scott, I wrote him up in bus 2.0. Not that spring Same. matters completely because we saw Carlos Estevez was awful last spring and then went on to save 31 games last year. So maybe opening day comes and Tanner Scott just flips the switch, but big, big walk issues in the mm -hmm. past. Uh, I'm with you. I think Anthony Bender, Andrew Nardi is a name to pay attention to there as well. Scott, back to you. Deep sleeper. I'm going to say Ty France is a deep sleeper. And obviously we liked his production. We thought he had underrated production about 2021, 2022 disappointed us last year, went to drive line this off season because he saw how much it would improve JP Crawford's game last year. And uh, so hopefully they worked his magic on him and, and at least Ty France could get back to those 2021, 2022 levels. If that happens, he's a discount. If he exceeds it, then even better. And the ADP is just outside of the top 300 for uh, Ty France. And he's locked into a job. He's going to play, right? He's always had good contact skills. If he can tap in to the power a little bit, then I do like that call as well. Another name that we've talked a lot about recently, but again, I just want to reiterate so everyone has him on their radar, is Ryan Weathers, who looks like he will be in the Marlins rotation at least to start the season. They're dealing with injuries to a lot of their pitchers right now. We know uh, Braxton Garrett is going to start on the IL, uh, and uh, Ryan Weathers has looked awesome this spring. He does have some prospect pedigrees. His velocity is up. He's 
hitting 99 miles per hour this spring. He's so far got a 132 ERA, 0.8 whip, 17 strikeouts over 13 and two-thirds innings. And it's a really good ballpark to pitch in in Miami. So maybe a name you pick up, see how it goes early on in the season. Maybe he turns into a streamer, whatever it might be. Ryan Weathers, a name of interest. Chris, back to you. Michael Bush, third baseman for the Chicago Cubs. Um, ah. I'm, su- I'm surprised <laughs> he's going this late at this point. Yeah, He is Scott White's number 32 prospect for fantasy baseball. Hit 323 with an OPS of almost 1050 at triple a last season there's a little bit of playing time risk in chicago and i think he got hit by a pitch either yesterday or today but i don't think it was uh significant enough even for him to leave the game so i don't think there's any concerns there but michael bush very good quality of contact metrics very good plate discipline i think there's a lot to like there in what should be a pretty good cubs offense too michael bush the adp is 356.3 over the past week scott uh yeah i feel like michael bush is the ultimate deep sleeper um i want to go ahead and include jonathan aranda in this even though we already talked about him it's kind of redundant but uh i just wanted to make sure people knew he is one of the deep sleepers i'm highest on and at least by uh fantasy pros adp he's he's not even listed that's how little jonathan aranda is mm-hmm. being drafted um if i could talk about a new one and this isn't probably isn't so much the case in two catcher, not in those champions leagues that are so deep, but Ryan Jeffers, Ryan Jeffers doesn't get talked about much among uh, catcher picks because there are so many high upside guys at that position that go be, it continues well beyond the, the one catcher league range, but Jeffers is not far behind them. He last year, with the twins had an 858 OPS 14 home runs and just 335 plate appearances. I do worry. Uh, the reason I don't include him like with the Luis Campusanos of the world is, is because the twins of like, remember Mitch Garver, remember how it went for him. They just refused to give him regular bats. And I kind of think it's playing out the same way for Ryan Jeffers, but if it's two catcher league and um, all the, that top 17 is all gone. Jeffers is one of my higher choices. All right, I'm going to give you uh, Jordan Westberg from the Baltimore Orioles, who is currently projected to be their starting third baseman. This is a name with big prospect pedigree. He was the 30th overall pick back in the 2020 draft. Last year in the minors, hit 295 with 18 home runs, six steals, and a 939 OPS. He played 68 games with the Orioles, added three homers, four steals, hits the ball decently hard, 90.2 average exit velocity. Really good zone contact rate, too, as a rookie, 85%. Like to see that. The only thing that might hold him back is the fact that he's a right-handed hitter in Camden Yards. But, man, I, I just like this Orioles offense, man. All these guys kind of coming up together. You know, while we're talking about Westberg, I'm going to throw Colton Cowser in this mix, too. I had him a little bit lower down the list. but Let's, let's throw Kobe Mayo in there. Throw Kobe Mayo in there, too. Yeah. Well, you know, if Jordan Westberg doesn't hit, Kobe Mayo is probably going to be right on his tail. So, uh, Colton Cowser, post-hype sleeper, former fifth overall pick back in 2021. Fell flat on his face last year. His first taste in the majors hit 115 over 61 at bats. He is having a monster spring. 11 for 26, four homers, one steal. Not sure that he's going to have a chance to play early on in the season, but things happen. Injuries happen. Cedric Mullins is dealing with that hamstring. Sounds like he'll be all right, but uh, yeah, if Colton Kowser plays his way onto the roster, he's one injury away from being an everyday player, I believe. Chris, back to you. How about a guy who could conceivably hit 15 homers and steal 30 bases? And we pay a lot of money for guys who can do those, except if their name is Brenton Doyle. And now the reason that we don't do that with Brenton Doyle is because he struck out 35% of the time and had absolutely horrific quality of contact metrics last season, Mm -hmm. which is a pretty bad combination. And that's how you have a 593 OPS at Coors Field. On the other hand, he might be the best defensive outfielder in baseball. And he is super fast. And he hit 10 home runs and stole 22 bases in 438, 431 plate appearances last season. So if he can get his strikeout rate down to like 30% and hit 240, I think Brenton Doyle can be a really useful fantasy option. Fully endorsed the Brenton Doyle. I drafted him in NL Labor as my fifth outfielder. His ADP is 345.9. And I read an article this offseason about he's how he's focused on cutting down the strikeouts. His K rate so far this spring is 15% in 33 plate appearances. So uh, encouraging so far in a small sample, 
for Brenton Doyle. Scott, you're up. Uh, let's see. I am going to. It's a little high by the NFBC standard, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say Luis Severino is a deep sleeper, and he's somebody I find myself drafting more and more. The he had he apparently had a uh, tipping issue with the Yankees that helps to explain why he was so bad last year, even though the velocities were still good, um, and he looked he looked like he was back in 2022. Uh, so real disappointing last year, but the Mets thought it was an easy fix, and and so far this spring the results back it up. I am going to go with Mason Wynn, who is a post-type sleeper. I actually wrote, wrote him up in Sleepers 2.0, and he will be the Cardinals' starting shortstop. Defense will keep him in the lineup. He might have already the best arm in the infield in all of baseball, and I do believe there's offensive talent here as well. Even though he didn't show it in his 37, uh, first 37 career games last year with the Cardinals, he was great in the minors, hit 288, 18 home runs, 17 steals, across 105 games at AAA. He did that as a 21-year-old. So age-to-level production, that is pretty damn impressive what Mason Wynn did. He only struck out in 19% of his plate appearances with the Cardinals, and he's really, really fast. 92nd percentile sprint speed. I think Mason Wynn can hit 10 homers with 20 steals and like a 250 batting average. It just would not surprise me if, if we get that from Mason Wynn this season. Chris, back over to you. Uh, off the top of their head, does anybody know Anthony Santander's ADP? Uh, I think it's inside of the top 200. Uh, it's uh, 145. Off the top of your head, <laughs> how would you like Anthony Santander but 230 picks later? <gasps> wow. Who is it? Sounds like a pretty good deal, right? Well, yeah. Hunter Renfro's ADP is barely inside the top 400. I know he didn't have a great season last year. But this is a guy that in 2021 and 2022 hit 31 and 29 homers. Last year, he hit 20 and 548 plate appearances. One of the better bets for power over the last decade, Hunter Renfro has been. I know it's not a great park. I know it's not a great lineup. Hunter Renfro might be batting fifth for the Royals. And if he just bounces back to 2021, 2022, he's going to be a huge disc, uh, a huge value. Chris, I will give you four other names that I had written down for later on that I think can provide 25 home runs that are going just extremely late in drafts. And I get it for multiple reasons. Mitch Hanniger, Jesus Sanchez. I love, love Mitch Hanniger for sure. Jesus Sanchez, Jock Peterson, and Michael Conforto. Yeah. Jock Peterson got a one-year, like $10 million contract. He's going to play. He's going to be in the middle of their lineup. Conforto is getting paid by the Giants. He's going to play. Jesus Sanchez, the Marlins just don't really have options, and he's... Yeah. Showed flashes of being able to hit the ball hard. Mitch Hanniger, two seasons removed from hitting 39 home mm -hmm. runs. This very team in this ballpark for the Seattle Mariners. He has played just 118 games since due to multiple injuries. He still has 17 home runs during that span and has hit the ball hard. 91.5 mm -hmm. average exit velocity over the past two years. So Hanniger, Sanchez, Jock Peterson, Conforto. I think you get some late round power from those guys. I got a couple other power hitters that I'm targeting as fifth outfielders in, in Roto Leagues. They go a little earlier than that, but more around the 300 to 325 range. And they are Brent Rooker and Matt Walner. And we've talked about Walner some on the podcast, Three True Outcomes guy uh, for the Twins. May sit against lefties. We haven't talked about Brent Rooker as much, and he might be an even safer bet. Um given i mean he hit 30 homers just last year it's not like the athletics are gonna it's not like he's getting bumped from that lineup for anybody else so uh brent rooker nice choice to fill out your outfield if you're looking for power late chris back to you yeah i'm trying to narrow it down how many more do we think we're going maybe uh, four, four or five more rounds on this yeah we've Forever. got i don't know five minutes left let's go with brett Beatty who mm -hmm. I assume yep. is still being drafted late enough to qualify this. Yes, 372.9, sure. huge raw power, and has not struck out much in the minors, certainly not for a guy who swings as hard as he does. He's never hit more than 21 homers in a season because his swing has not been optimized for pull contact in the air. But Brett Beatty has talked this offseason about wanting to hit the ball to right field, wanting to hit more line drives and fly balls to right field. It's exactly what you want to hear. No guarantee that he does it, but this is a guy who was viewed as a very similar prospect to Tristan Casas this time last year. Obviously, they've gone in 
slightly different directions since then, but I think Brett Beatty still has absolute star potential. How about two speedy outfielders in the similar mold of a uh, Brenton Doyle, who we mentioned earlier, Jose Caballero, who yep. is projected to be the starting shortstop for the Tampa Bay Rays. He came over in that trade with the Mariners involving Luke Raley, and he only hit 221 last year, but he had 26 deals in 104 games. He's a really strong fielder, which you know the Tampa Bay Rays are going to value, and he was 90th percentile sprint speed last year. Again, that is Jose Caballero. The other name is Garrett Mitchell, who is part of a crowded outfield in Milwaukee, but he was a popular sleeper last year, and he missed most of the season with a left shoulder subluxation. This is a former first-round pick back in 2020. Uh, has put up some solid numbers in the minors. He is extremely fast. 94th percentile sprint speed. Could even lead off against right-handed pitching for the Brewers. So two speedy names there. Garrett Mitchell, Jose Caballero. Scott, we're back to you. Tim Anderson is still being drafted ridiculously late, and we have a little more insight into what happened to him last year. We theorized about that knee injury he suffered early on. This is what he had to say after signing with the Marlins. The injury took a toll. You're talking about the front side of an MCL sprain. I had nothing to hit up against. It led to a lot of ground balls, uh, no excuses, et cetera, et cetera. He offered like a mechanical explanation for what the injury did to him that I think is is I think makes a lot of sense. And if so, Tim Anderson outside the top 300 could be a huge value for you. Yeah, he was hitting through the first 10 games before that knee injury. Very small sample size, I know, but 318 with five steals in those 10 games. He was Tim Anderson until he got hurt. Chris, take it away. Continue on. Uh. <sighs> Okay, we'll we'll do two corner infielders who could score 90 plus runs this season. DJ LeMahieu, okay. leadoff hitter for the New York Yankees. They want him to hit leadoff, and it sounds like that's going to be the case. And Nolan Shanuel for the Los Angeles Angels. Did you see the home run he hit the other day? I think I actually did. He he looks like he's doing Shohei Otani coast play. <laughs> like he looks like he's just doing show, like uh, he's not that good i just thought that was funny um shanuel was the first player from last year's draft to make his major league debut they rushed him up after like 20 games in the minors terrific plate discipline i think he had 70 walks and 17 strikeouts or something his uh final year in college walked more than he struck out last year as a pro not going to be very much power but he's hitting second in front of mike trout for the uh, los angeles angels and i think he could actually pretty easily score 90 runs this season if he stays healthy and hits at the top of the lineup. It is legitimately amazing to me that the player projected to bat in front of Juan Soto and Aaron Judge is getting mm -hmm. as little attention as he is, DJ LeMahieu. And like part, he's been bad I, the last few seasons, but he hasn't been unplayably bad. He was much better in the second half, too. Sounded like he kind of figured something out. I, I think if Anthony Volpe takes the step forward that a lot of people think he will then maybe LeMahieu doesn't last very long at the top of the lineup because Volpe slots there. But, I mean, that, that obviously didn't work out last year. All right, I'm going to give you three Brewers. Uh, two are deep for, like, a 12-teamer. and No, one is deep for a 12-teamer and two deep for, like, a 15-teamer. Um, Sal Freelich is one of them. I'm amazed how late I get him. I pe think people aren't giving his steals potential enough credit because he didn't run a ton during his short time up last year but he's fast and he ran in the minors and he's a ton of batting average potential and he's might have triple eligibility because he's been playing third base and second this spring um, and then the other two are also guys who could play second or third base for the brewers one is joey ortiz or joseph mm -hmm. ortiz as he's known on our site great exit velocity readings uh, in the minors, and um, I think a lot of untapped potential there. That's that's obviously why the Brewers targeted him in that uh, Corbin Burns trade, and also even deeper sleeper uh, Tyler Black. A lot of speed, a lot of on base skills. I doubt. I mean, it doesn't seem like he's going to be on the opening day roster, but he may not be down for long. I'm going to continue on with uh, three prospects as well and Justin Foscue looks like he could be the starting first baseman while Nate Lowe is hurt 25 Good years old former first round pick back in 2020 last year hit 266 with 18 home runs 14 steals and 862 OPS more walks than strikeouts now the quality of contact wasn't great but 
you know, if he's starting every day in the first month of the season for the Texas Rangers, then I do think there's some upside there. A name we haven't talked about is Chase DeLauder with the Cleveland Guardians. I don't mm -hmm. know that he's going to be up that early in the season, but he's having a really big spring so far, hitting 467 with two homers. He played in the AFL where he looked really good as well. He had five home runs, five steals. I saw a few plate appearances while I was out there. And just total control over the plate. Like, great plate discipline. Looks like he's ready. And obviously, the Guardians could use some offense. And Justin Henry Malloy with the Detroit Tigers, who has played some third base, some corner outfield in the minors. And he has another name where he doesn't have, like, huge tools. I don't know that he's going to give you a big power or, or speed, really. But he's going to get on base. I think he can hit 20 homers, maybe 5 to 10 steals, something like that. Uh, and because of his position versatility, I think we might see Justin Henry Malloy pretty early in the season here with the Detroit Tigers. Chris, back to you. I don't know. Just throw as many my way as you want. As, as uh, okay. Uh, DL Hall, starting pitcher for the Milwaukee Brewers. I believe he's relief mm -hmm. pitcher eligible on CBS. Gigantic, gigantic stuff. He's got just, I mean, he could be a Dylan Cease type. The control is worse, but. If he can figure that out and keep the walk somewhat in control, I think DL Hall has huge upside. I know everybody loves Ju Edward Julian, but Brooks Lee still has a chance to make the opening day roster for the Twins, I believe. I don't think he's been sent down yet. I, uh, he I, is, I, I know they re uh, they reassigned a bunch of players. Yeah, today. maybe it happened today or yesterday, but I hadn't seen it yet. Uh, top 50 prospect for the Minnesota Twins was their number one pick, number eight overall in the 2022 draft. Uh, Brooks Lee is someone that I'm looking at as a deep sleeper. Joe Boyle, uh, I know the command has regressed over the past couple starts in the spring. Still think there's gigantic strikeout upside. Orion Kirkering, we, we think that the Phillies are not 100% uh, in on Jose Alvarado as the closer, not because he's not good, but because they – you know, might want to have some flexibility in how they use him. Orion Kirkring has struck out 37% of hitters since turning pro. Legitimately might already be the best slider in, in the majors based on what we saw last season. Uh, I think that's a great way to spend a late round pick. And um, <laughs> Jack Leiter. Oh. In a super, super deep. Super deep. Uh, draft. Remember, he was the number two pick in the 2021 draft. He's been awful. Five, 537 ERA across two seasons, but his velocity has been up significantly in the spring, about one and a half miles per hour. Uh, at least last I saw it, I didn't, didn't see his most recent outing. Um, that could be a sign that he's starting to rediscover some of the form that made him you know, one of the most hype pro pitching prospects of the decade when he was in college and you know, th there's definitely still a need in the Rangers rotation. So Jack Leiter, super deep sleeper, would have to be one of these deep, deep draft and holds. It does not look like Brooks Lee has been reassigned. or okay, I didn't think so. Yeah, we'll see. Scott, how many can you rattle off in a minute? Not enough, <laughs> especially since I am not off to a fast start here. Uh, okay, let's go with Kyle Manzardo. If he's not on opening day roster for the Guardians, he won't be down long. Did you already say him? No. no. Okay. Um, let's also go with... Uh, <laughs> okay, Frank, you noticed it too, right? Did Scott just freeze and then talk really, really fast <laughs> after that? Is that what happened? Yeah, it, like... Okay, is he frozen right now? He's frozen again. Okay, yeah, so we're not being... <laughs> Scott's internet is kind of uh, crapping out okay, on Okay, are, are we in... Oh, am I good now? You're frozen with a great face on, too. <laughs> yes, you're here. Okay, Ricky Tiedemann. He won't be down. He'll, he'll eventually be in the Blue Jays rotation mm -hmm. and get a lot of strikeouts. Uh, uh, Reese Olsen yep. looked good this spring. And I think he'll, you know, he, he should be in the Tigers starting five to start out. Emmett Sheehan's being pushed down so much with his injury news that I think he's now a candidate for this. I still think the stuff is terrific and I still think he'll make enough starts in the Dodgers that for the Dodgers that you'll be glad you stashed him away. Uh, Gavin stone, his teammate, I guess who's probably going to take his spot to begin the year is also a deep sleeper. I mean, some of the players we talk about a lot meet the threshold for this discussion, like Eric Fetty, like Joe Boyle, like 
Frankie Montas, who I think is going to be the Reds opening day starter. I think mm-hmm. I saw that. Yep. Uh, like uh, Chris Paddock. Um, JP Sears has kind of caught my attention this spring. That's going quite a bit deeper, though. Uh, we talked about Sedan, Sedani Rafaela, Parker Meadows as a power speed guy who should play a lot for the Tigers. I, like I think fits the description. Uh, Alec Burleson, we talked about him some recently. If he's going to fill in for Lars Newtbar to begin the year, and I think has a really good hitting profile, uh, hard contact and a lot of contact. Uh, anybody else here that I want to throw in there? Um, Elahiris Montero, your yeah. guy, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my starting <laughs> corner in into regular <laughs> bats for the Rockies. Not that it's a given. Reynaldo Lopez, I'd call a deep sleeper. AJ Puck, we've talked about him a lot recently. Yeah, I don't think he qualifies anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the last week, we still have uh, uh, Jackson Merrill going around 400. Mm -hmm. So that. I think I I saw some people tweeting about his ADP since he was named to the opening day, and he's now like firmly inside the top 250. Okay. Okay. So that's still a nice value, but not not necessarily deep sleeper anymore. Yeah. I think that's going to... Oh, you know what? One more name. Uh-oh. Victor Scott. He's on my list. I, I feel bad the way I did that to Chris. Literally the first the name I mentioned. I was going for the laugh, but it just felt dirty. Uh, and I dirty feel Scott. bad. Dirty Victor Scott. Scott is very fast, and he's been batting lead off a lot, and he hits the ball hard for what looks like a slap hitter profile. And um, I wouldn't put him in the top 150 if he was a short of a job at that I, I meant that when I said it, but he'd be in my top 250. Yeah. For sure. Uh can I can I make one more name? No. Yes, you can. To make up for Scott being <laughs> so rude to me. Um <laughs> Yon Mankata. Ah, I, had uh, I know we've kind of given up on him, but he's outside of the top 360. He's gonna hit second for the White Sox, it sounds like. And he had uh an awesome September last year. Yeah, well, we'll see if he can. I think he's a free agent at the end of this year, if I'm remembering correctly. So little contract year incentive there for you. Um, Yeah. And if anybody wants any more deep sleepers that we haven't got to, I know Chris has written multiple articles about this already. Scott has an article coming out on Friday, Scott. Deep sleepers. If, 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 if the breaking news will stop, (laughs) I will, I will have that out on Friday. Like Snell and Jordan Montgomery are definitely signing tomorrow. aren't they? Uh It'll either happen on Friday or next week. So there are deep sleeper articles on the site. There are more coming and I will wrap up with just a few pictures. I wanted to mention Garrett Whitlock, Tanner Houck with the Red Sox. Both Mm -hmm. of them, I think fit this description. Zach Littell, a name we never talk about. Yep. He's the number three starter in the race rotation. He's a spark on CBS made 14 starts last year. 341 ERA, 105 whip during that time. Just doesn't really get a lot of strikeouts. And Kyle Hendricks, boring, but he was good last mm-hmm. year. Yeah. Uh, the pitcher who will get the first save for the White Sox this year, Jordan Leisure. Book it. We're going to wrap mm-hmm. there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we'll be back again tomorrow. Bye bye.